So Xbox president Sarah Bond went on to a Bloomberg panel leveling up the gaming industry. Wow. And she spoke about all of this stuff that happened and uh, it didn't it didn't go great. Sure didn't. Nation with Bloomberg's Dina Bass. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. So I want to start talking about the industry in general. Uh, you and Microsoft Games CEO Phil Spencer have been raising kind of the alarm that the video game industry is just not growing and there's a real need to figure out how to reverse that. What's causing the issue and, and how, does, how does Xbox turn it around? Yeah, you know, um, the last year or so in video games, largely the industry has been flat. Um, and even in 2023, we saw just some tremendous releases, um, tremendously groundbreaking games, but still the, the growth didn't follow all of that. Um, to be clear, growth means year over year spending increases and increased like user spend where each individual player is spending more money, those types of stats. If you're looking at like the number of 10 out of 10 games, that certainly grew last year, but in terms of actual spending, and like consumer spending across the whole industry, it did drop in the last year, which is why they're freaking out. And you know, a lot of that's related to our need to bring new players in. All of that has been happening at the same time that the cost associated with making these beautiful AAA blockbuster games is going up and the time it takes to make them is going up. And so- Just talking too slow, I'm sorry. Well, so much of our focus uh, as Xbox is about how we do things to help the industry all up, um, while also ensuring that our brand, you know, everything that we do is there through this moment of transition. Related to some of the trends you're identifying, you know, earlier this week, Xbox announced the shuttering of four game studios. I, I know you're not the studio's chief, but how should we, how should gamers understand that move in terms of Microsoft's commitment to developing innovative, exclusive games? Yeah, you know, it's, it's always extraordinary. Big, a big question. Big question. She already gave her an out, if you didn't catch that. It's very sneaky of the interviewer. I know you're not the head of the studios. So if she wants an easy out, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's not a decision that I, I was making. I wasn't responsible for the ultimate decision at the end of the day. Of course, I stand by our very capable team of executives and leaders, but uh, I think for a firmer idea of what that was, you'll need to speak to Matt Booty, who is the, the head of studios for us. Easy out. You sort of answered it, but you didn't, and you just dodged it. She gave her an out already, but let's see if she if she nails it. Microsoft's commitment to developing innovative, exclusive games. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that. Um, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying about the industry, and when we look at those fundamental trends, we feel a deep responsibility to ensure that the games we make, the devices we build, the services that we offer are there um, through moments, even when the industry isn't growing and when you're through a time of transition. And the news we announced earlier this week is, is an outcome of that uh, and our commitment to make sure that the business is healthy for the long term. Uh, but, but that said, our, our commitment to having our own studios and working with partners to have games large and small, you know, we're a platform where you can play GTA, but you can also play Power World, where you can play Call of Duty and you can also play Pentiment. That, that doesn't change. Um, and frankly, our commitment to the to Bethesda and the role that it plays is part of Xbox and everything we do. It's actually been pretty fantastic. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to check it out. Um, the Fallout TV show was on Amazon. <laughs> Why did you lay off four studios? Well, the Xbox, like, you know, we, we do stuff. And the, the Fallout show was great, wasn't it? <laughs> wow, okay. I would have just taken the out the interviewer gave you. That would have worked better. I think that would have worked a lot better. It's almost like the interview is trying to help you because none of these interviews are really about finding out good information for investors. It's about uh, just kind of patting the executives on the head and being like, you did so good. Good job. You're so impressive. I The, the verbiage that is used is like, we're in a transition, the market and industry shrinking. And then also it's always extraordinarily difficult when you have to make decisions like that. I think that's exactly what she she said, right? That was the, the exact phrase. Time of transition, uh, fundamental trends. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that. You know, I'll go back to what I was saying about the industry. And when we looked at those fundamental trends, we feel a deep responsibility to ensure the games that we make devices, we build the services we offer 
are there through those moments, even when the industry isn't growing and when you're through a time going through a time of transition. And the news we announced earlier this week is an outcome of that. It's an outcome of, of being in a time of transition. Okay. What I think this means, time of transition means we acquired a bunch of studios and we think there's bloat that we need to cut. I think that's what she means. So like Arcane Austin, I think they looked at that and said, eh, we don't think that that's going to be super profitable for us moving forward. We could spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, revamping it and, you know, rehiring and training and working on another project and all that. We could do all of that, but it's just going to be easier for us if we just cut it and, and move on, put that money elsewhere. Okay. Okay. Tango Gameworks. I also have a feeling that maybe, you know, they thought that some of the, the sh like, head honchos that were really responsible for building that studio up since they've left they thought that maybe it wasn't as valuable as it was a few years ago so they decided to cut that again i still think it was a major blunder to shut that down and i think we're seeing the consequences of it because i think microsoft is used to treating closures and stuff like shutting down a, a, a little company you acquired that has 50 people or 100 people that did some software engineering in the middle of nowhere like but it's just different like those companies don't have fans <laughs> you know that's the difference is that you can if microsoft hires or, or buys out a company that has a bunch of teams all around the world and they say develop software for for maybe it's it's like uh it's gonna be used for windows defender or something and it's software that's used to detect viruses and things like that and they take that company and they they shut down a few teams around the world that have like a total of 500 employees people like who work there are upset but nobody is going to be like lighting them up on social media for layoffs you know like nobody's going to be doing that in the games industry those teams have fans those teams have have people that wear t-shirts of their logo like none of that none of that work like it, it just doesn't follow and i think microsoft's hopefully learning that you cannot treat your studios the same way you would treat software teams that are developing something for windows it just doesn't work <laughs> yeah like i said i'm actually a big fan of the windows defender team they're my favorite in fact <laughs> can you imagine like walking around like wearing a windows 11 alpha build team t-shirt like yeah i love those guys did you work with them no no i just love their work like what <laughs> it would be weird but like that's how microsoft's approaching this and they just have to learn that it, it doesn't work i think honestly you know they said we had to make a decision like that it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that and here i knowing microsoft as a company i i think it's fair to say that the the mandate for the layoffs probably came from above them it probably came from satya and the cfo and they were told you need to lay off eight percent of staff whatever it is like they, they were probably told they need to do that and that was the command from the people higher up from their bosses and in a corporate company any company when your boss tells you to do something you have to do it even if it sucks and so i think they probably were strong-armed into doing it uh because if they don't do it someone else is going to come along take their position and do it like it, it that's just how it is when your boss tells you to do something you have to do it and so i think they probably were told you have to fire people i just think they chose in the form of Tango Gameworks specifically, I think they chose the wrong team to do it. And I will say like people have said, oh, but this is a $3 trillion company and they're laying people off, cringe. Like, I think that's the stupidest freaking counter to this. And it's because they're a $3 trillion company because they do stuff like this. If they didn't lay people off to keep budgets super, super precisely in line with expectations and investor expectations, they wouldn't be worth $3 trillion. Like that's why they're worth that is because they do stuff like this. You know, people that, that have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to corporate finance, they'll look at it and they're like, oh, well, well, you know, they have plenty of money, so they could definitely do it. You're right. They could, if they wanted to, but the reason they're worth $3 trillion is because they don't do that stuff. So for them to flip it and then start like, well, yeah, this company, this team isn't profitable or we don't think we can make money over here. Uh, and yeah, our margins are really low, but we're just going to eat it because we're a big company and we can we can do that. That would cause investors to like lower the valuation. Like that's that's why Sony's stock has been dropping. Like I think it's like 12 percent 
for the last uh, like year to date, basically, they've lost a ton of stock value because their margins are so tiny because they've been eating the costs of of studios and and teams and projects that weren't making money. They like, oh, we tried to make a Last of Us online game that totally didn't go anywhere. We lost hundreds of millions of dollars trying to do that. OK, well, we'll just eat it right. Microsoft wouldn't do that, which it's probably good that they don't own a company like Naughty Dog because they probably would have shut them down or something after that. But like, this is the thing, like Microsoft as a corporation has been built up to be a machine that just grows and it grows at the expense of the people and teams within it uh, often, um, but to the benefit of its shareholders and, and uh, stakeholders. Well, not necessarily stakeholders, specifically the shareholders. And so when somebody's like, they should just eat the cost of all of this, it's like, should they, if they're trying to boost stock prices? No, they shouldn't. If they're trying to do, like be better for their employees and like do the right ethical thing, then yeah, they probably should. But like, is anybody really shocked? Shocker, big corporation, not doing like necessarily the most ethical thing to boost <laughs> stock price. Like I can't, I'm surprised this is like breaking news, but there you go. And it's been great to see people fall in love with that universe, but also what it's done for the games themselves and people going back and exploring everything that's inside of that. There's some other great things that are coming from our studios later this year, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. I was a big indie fan growing up. Uh, looks like you were too. Um, uh, so you should check that out. Um, but really right now for us and our teams, our focus is on the people impacted um, and doing everything that we can do to help them through this hard transition. I think one of the things that was most upsetting. Hard transition, I, like, but what is the hard transition specifically? In the context of this conversation, she's only been describing like, it's it's because we're at a period where the games industry is not growing. It's basically flat. So what, what are we transitioning to? I guess that's my question. We're coming out of COVID when things grew a ton. And I think that that's more what this is. Like COVID caused people to spend a lot more money than they probably should have on gaming and on gaming referred like or related uh, peripherals and stuff because everybody wanted to be a streamer. Everybody wanted to be a gaming YouTuber. Everybody started trying to play a lot more games. And, and so we saw gaming spend just skyrocket, especially because people were stuck at home. And as COVID has closed down, things have, have kind of settled down and trickled down. But now they're saying that we're in a transitionary period. Things are changing. And I just want to know what they think it's changing to. In the case of Microsoft, it seems like their approach with Xbox is that they're shifting towards a much more cloud-based future with xCloud being a, a main player, which is why a lot of investors are actually not that worried about the console game uh, or the consoles um, not selling as well as PlayStation because they see a future in like 10 years when everybody's just going to stream games to their devices. Like they anticipate internet connections and everything being so good that you're not going to need to download games onto your, your computers anymore. Like you'll just, oh, I want to play the new Indiana Jones game. Click, I'm in. Like that's where they see the future of gaming being. I don't think that will go over too well because I think they're underestimating how much people value actually owning their their games, but we'll see. Yeah, that sounds horrible for preservation. Yeah, that hasn't stopped them yet. I'll tell you what, <laughs> it sure hasn't, sure hasn't. Both to Xbox gamers and to employees is that, you know, one of the Shuttered Studios in particular just created a hit game, did really well on Game Pass in, in terms of engagement and won a ton of awards. I mean, shouldn't succeeding in that way ensure the future of, of a studio? That's a good question. That's a very good question. And my stance on all this has just been that I think even if it is the case that some executives within Tango Gameworks or people that were responsible for making that studio really good back in the day, even if those people left, they just put out your best game of 2023, according to critics and you shut them down. And that message, what, what, like the message that that sends to all the other studios through your whole team is that you can make the best game of the year and we'll still close you down. If we just decide that we don't think you have enough potential or you didn't make enough, whatever it was. And it's not even clear what the metric was that determined it. But that sends a message to the rest of your teams that there is no stability here. You can make the best game of the year and still lose your job. And that's no way to buy loyalty. That's no way to get anybody wanting to stick with you in the long term. That doesn't work. It's a really, really bad thing. And that's why I think that was such a huge miscalculation because they're treating it like closing down the software development team that lives in Nebraska and just, you know, you shut them down. Okay, that sucks. They got laid off. But nobody's really losing their minds. The media isn't grilling you over it. People aren't massively attacking you on social media. In the gaming space, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. <laughs> so I think it's a, a good question from the interviewer. And let's see how I'm sure Sarah Bond, the president of Xbox, let's see 
how she directly and concisely addresses this question, asking her, why did you close down Tango Gameworks when they made your most like praised game of last year? Shouldn't releasing the best game of your portfolio in the last year, shouldn't that at the very least guarantee that you're not going to be shut down within 12 months? Let's see how she directly addresses it. You know, one of the things I really love about the games industry is it's a creative art form. And it means that the situation and what success is for each game and studio is also really unique. Like there's no one size fits all to it for us. Um, and so we look at each studio, each game team, and we look at a whole variety of factors when we're faced with sort of making decisions and, and trade-offs like that. Uh, but it all comes back to our long-term commitment to the games we create, the devices we build, the services, and ensuring that we're setting ourselves up to be able to deliver on those promises. I'm sorry. I think I just blacked out. Did she not answer that? <laughs> like what? <laughs> no part of that answered the question at all. No part of it. Like, yeah, we just want to be set up in that uh, game with uh, the different quality of the abilities to be for performance and focus areas for Xbox. Next question, please. <laughs> like that was, that was painful. That's embarrassing. It would have been less embarrassing if she got up and jumped through this window behind her screaming that she had seen a ghost. That would have been much more reasonable than what just happened. That's embarrassing. And I'm I'm saying this like Xbox fam. I'm saying this as somebody that is a, a retail investor, okay? I buy shares of, of stock constantly. I love it. I eat it up. If I were looking at buying shares of Microsoft and I heard that answer, I would seriously doubt and question the uh, capabilities of the leadership. If you're asked a, a direct question, shouldn't your teams be given some more stability if they make the best game that you had last year uh, in terms of critical reception, shouldn't that at least guarantee them a little safety? And you just straight up de decline to answer the question because honestly, there is no good answer. There is no good answer. I mean, other than saying, listen, a lot of the executives and people that were there that we thought added the most value to Tango Gameworks, they had left um, in the last couple of years. We love Hi-Fi Rush, but we were not confident the team would be able to do something on that level again. So we decided to lay off the, the, the team. In addition, it's a, it's a Japanese studio. We didn't feel like we had the the means to reasonably oversee all of the studios under the ZeniMax umbrella without it causing more trouble than it was worth. So we just decided to shutter it. If she had said something like that, at least that's an answer. But instead, she just straight up refuses to answer. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But Luke, uh -huh, AI, 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 their stock go up. Boom. Yeah. I mean, basically it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the old meme is that it's, it's like corporate speak, corpo speak where like they bounce around and say stuff. It's like, uh, you know, Mr. CEO, is it true that you've been grinding up baby chickens and puppies to turn them into McNuggets? And the CEO goes, you know, what I love about our food is that our food comes from all around the world. And we work with our talented team of chefs to produce food that people find delicious and love and we sell millions of dollars of it every single day. And I just find that to be utterly remarkable. And, you know, it shows that as a company, we can span the globe and take pieces from all over, uh, you know, whether it's it's meats from all different animals or if it's plants from all over the world, and we can bring them together and distribute them to a new group of customers around the planet. It's really a beautiful thing. And you're like, wait, but, but are you making me eat baby cats and dogs? <laughs> it's like, um, it's a beautiful thing that we're doing. <laughs> it just doesn't answer the question at all, but it just spins and spins and spins. And that's basically what just happened. And it's a, a staple of, of corporate stuff. Um, and it's, it's really sucky. You know, we, when I was in college, we did a, a class um, that was, it was under some other name, but it was, it basically turned into like corporate PR. And it was like, what happens when you uh, have a company that like really screws up? How do you handle those catastrophes and stuff? And, it was interesting because basically it just came down to, well, we 
we uh you, like you maybe acknowledge the question and then you bring up something positive and you you spin it into how your company does that positive thing that's tangentially related to the bad thing that happened or that you're accused of and then you just stop talking and then the interviewer 95 percent of the time gets really uncomfortable and we'll just move on to the next question because a lot of interviewers and and journalists are not the types to like press extra hard you know she just if I were interviewing her, which this is precisely why I would never be allowed to interview her. But if I were interviewing her sitting on stage right now, I'd be like, respectfully, uh, Miss Miss Bond, uh, I don't know if she's Mrs. Or, or Miss, but respectfully, Miss Bond, that did not answer the question. Shouldn't studios have some semblance of stability if they released your most critically praised game in the last year? Shouldn't that, at the very least, guarantee that they won't be shuttered within... 18 months. And then you just keep pressing until you get an answer. And if she ends up saying, listen, we're just, we're not going to talk about the decision to close the studio. It's just not something we are prepared to discuss today. Make her say that. And then at least she's stating clearly, she's not going to answer the question instead of doing this weird thing where like she bounces around and pretends like she talked about it and answered it when it just doesn't do anything like this has been roundly mocked and for good reason. Yeah. Share your thoughts on the recent closures of the four studios. Sarah follow TV series was great. Interviewer, talk about why you closed four video game studios. <laughs> this woman will receive millions of dollars by the end of this year while hundreds of devs will lose their jobs. F this shiz. Xbox and Microsoft love to deflect, take no responsibility for their own failures and mismanagement instead of blame it on the market. What a joke. She's completely defeated. She has no answers. She's great at giving non-answers. There is something truly distasteful about somebody working at such a high position who doesn't even care about the industry she's in. Uh, I think, what was her background? Where is she from? I think she's from... Call of Duty? Is that where she's she got started? Let's see. Commencing her career as an associate partner at McKinsey and Company, transitioning to T-Mobile, Bond held key roles, including chief of staff to CEO Jean Leger, who is that T-Mobile guy, and late senior vice president of corporate strategy and development. In 2017, Bond joined Microsoft starting as a corporate vice president overseeing the gaming business development and partnerships at Xbox. She later assumed the position of corporate vice president of game creation or game creator experience and ecosystem. Notably, Bond played a pivotal role in representing Microsoft during the scrutinized bid to acquire Activision Blizzard, including testifying at the 2022 FTC versus Microsoft trial. I think that's the main reason she's where she is, is that she took those blows while getting the acquisition across the board. But I thought I thought she was from Activision. I didn't realize that she has no experience there. She's from a management consulting firm that then went and started working with uh, T-Mobile, and then she was brought on to Microsoft from there. In 2022, she received Visionary Award from Games Beat in 2022 for her contributions to the industry. And then in 2023, she was promoted to president of Xbox, reporting directly to Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer. What has she contributed, though? That's like I genuinely don't understand. Our first winner is Sarah Bond, vice president for game creator experience and ecosystem, which what does that even mean? Let's see. Sarah has continuously moved with purpose and vision through the games industry. She has cultivated a gaming experience that is as cutting edge as it is diverse. Through her contributions to Xbox, we are able to see the future of gaming reflected in mentorship and leadership. Recognizing Sarah for her hard work at, was an obvious choice when thinking of someone in the game space who has consistently made her visionary work a reality. Sarah has proving or has been paving the way for a culture in gaming that is rich in experience and has depth in its diverse partnerships. They can't name like a single thing that she's done though. Oh my God. We also have a video presentation from John Riccitello. Riccitello. CEO of Unity with some words about Sarah. Uh, do you know who this guy is? Do you remember this guy? This is the guy that just retired and resigned in disgrace after blowing up Unity. That's so funny. That's so, so this is the guy that they used as, <laughs> as the explanation for her fantastic accomplishments. You can't make this stuff up, dude. You can't make it up. He said, yes, her accomplishments prove she has the intellect, the brain, and the drive. I'm here to say she also has the heart. She's the full package. And then he charged everyone who heard him say that.
a dollar. Uh, in her acceptance speech, Bond said, I am just incredibly humbled and proud to accept this reward. In life, we all have the power to imagine and dream about a better world. And I find myself doing that a lot these days, especially all that we have been and continue to go through over the past two years. But what I want to talk about today is how I believe we can move from dreaming to actually building a better world and the pivotal role that games and in everyone who makes games plays in making that possible. I fundamentally believe that the foundation to a better world is empathy. Bro, that is aged so badly. Have empathy to make the world a better place. Also, you're fired. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. Wow. Okay. I, I'm just, normally you can look at like those awards and you can figure out like, okay, they were responsible for this, this, and this, and that's why we gave them this award. I, I'm not seeing anybody outline anything that she's done. Dinga Bakaba, who is the studio director at Arcane Lyon, uh, this is the guy that also tore them a new one when they just closed Arcane Austin. But those are the two people that won these these like visionary awards. I just I, I'm genuinely confused. I don't know what she's done that has got her to this this role. Like it's not like she's run a company successfully herself. It's not like she's she's done anything that stunning or shocking. She was at a consulting firm, was a chief of staff under T-Mobile CEO, and then went and worked at Microsoft and then was promoted to president. Like, how did she get there? I don't get it. And honestly, as the president of Xbox, one thing within the gaming industry, because we're a fan-based industry where you need to have fans rooting for you, you have to have leadership that the community respects. Otherwise, like the community roots for your downfall. And that was one of the things that happened. Like once the community identified Jim Ryan as like a snake uh, and as somebody that was just a corpo trying to push for live service crap at the expense of everything else, his days were numbered. Like you were just gonna, you were never gonna find a lot of success with it. But it's why somebody like Sean Layden was beloved, same with like Reggie fils and they were able to lead their companies to all time highs while they were at the helm. And right now you can see the, the fans of this industry have turned on Phil Spencer and have turned on Sarah Bond. As far as I'm aware, there's there's almost no respect for Sarah Bond because she also doesn't seem to be an actual gamer. She at least knows the names of games that they've got on their platform, like Pentiment, which is a deep cut. That's a good one to reference. But she doesn't seem like a gamer. Phil Spencer seems like a gamer, which has been the one reason a lot of people have given him credit. But I, as far as I know, she's like, she she doesn't, she doesn't do anything. And I just want to know why she is the best person to run Xbox as the president of Xbox. And it doesn't seem like there's any answers. You're just supposed to like smile and nod, which is weird to me. Um, Matt Booty at least has been exposed to the gaming side of things for a very long time, as has Phil Spencer. He's worked within Xbox for ages, but I don't know why she specifically is a good fit for the gaming side of the business. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense. She's probably competent from an executive point of view. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure she's very capable. I mean, you. You do not get, this is one of the misconceptions, you do not get to an executive position without being talented in multiple ways. To get there, you have to be capable. Like somebody like Satya Nadella, don't give two craps about anything other than your performance and abilities. Um, I think she's a corporate suit, which is my point. I, I'm not saying that she shouldn't have a job, period. I just think that she is not actually like a gamer's advocate or anything. I think she's probably much more of the corporate um, big wig than she would like to let on. Yeah, so somebody posted this. And so some of these are leaked, some of these are rumored, some of these are confirmed. But if you look at all these, these different teams and stuff, the question is, if you were told by Papa Satya that you need to shut down four of these studios or three of these studios, whatever it would be, what do you pick if you are Xbox leadership? Like that's where it's it's a little tougher because it has to be in something you own. It's almost certainly not going to be any of these because these all are your money makers. Toys for Bob, maybe with Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, but those are things that are rumored or very small teams. Blizzard, almost all of these make good money. They've rumored, I think they've canceled the survival game. I don't know if that was confirmed yet. Uh, I think they did though. But yeah, in exile is working on Clockwork Revolution, right? I think this is an older graph. Uh, yeah, June of 2022. So there's there's a lot more going on. This is like two years old. But if you have to pick teams within this to lay off, like it's gonna be a little bit tough. Like it's gonna be tough to come up with who you lay off. 
And I think that that's the tough spot they found themselves in is they're like, yeah, we can lay off some of these. And like, I think Arcane Austin, that one made sense. I think they're like, yep, that probably makes sense. Get rid of them. And then Roundhouse, I think also was closed. So they got shut down. Uh, Tango now is shut down. And then the, the, one of the mobile studios got shut down, but I, I just think Tango Gameworks was specifically the worst one to pick because they made the best reviewed game of last year, you know? So I think they're between a rock and a hard place. I just think Tango Gameworks specifically was a huge optical blunder. When you're looking at the whole catalog, it's like, well, where else do you trim fat? If you have to lay off 1,900 people, which is what they have to lay off according to the, the reports and what Microsoft has said, They've got to find 1,900 jobs to cut because this is how it works. If you're the CEO or president of Xbox and you're told by Satya and the CFO and everybody, you're told you need to cut 1,900 jobs. This is what you're playing with and then some. But like you're looking at this, what do you pick? Where do you cut? You got to come up with 1,900 jobs. Like maybe 50 from here. You close down 10 people over here. Maybe you shut down this particular team or that like whatever it is. But you got to find it. And I think that's the tough spot they were in. And my point is not like, I don't think it's fair to blame Phil Spencer and uh, Sarah Bond and Matt Booty for the fact there are layoffs, because I think that that's coming from above them. What I think is fair to be upset with them over is that they're choosing developers, even that put out the best game they had last year and they're shutting them down. Redfall, colossal flop. They get shut down. Tango Gameworks, best game they had last year they also get shut down and it's just a bad look. He took my thing.